Hey everyone, this is John Muller with Dominatrix Genetics and today we're going to be going over how to start cannabis from seed. We do a lot of seed production here at Dominatrix Genetics. It's kind of the backbone of breeding if you will. Uh, basically when you cross a male and a female cannabis plant it produces seed. And so we provide these for our customers, uh, the growers, to grow out and basically have access to all the wonderful genetics um, that you know the world of cannabis has to offer. Uh, this video is going to be a tutorial. We're going to go over all of the foundational basic stuff you need to know to start uh, cannabis seeds. We're going to go all the way from the initial planting up to sectioning your plants because ultimately when you start from seed you need to be able to identify which are the females and which are the males so that you can separate them out in your production. Um, why start from seed? Basically, when you start from seed, you get access to the true diversity that is available within the cannabis genome. When you start from a cutting, every cutting that you get from a specific variety is genetically identical, so they're all exactly the same. That's good as far as your ability to do large-scale production and have really uniform plants, but you're ultimately growing the same thing that lots of other growers are growing. And so, you know, that's fine if you're okay with that. But if you want something truly unique that only you have, uh, you're not going to get that from cuttings because ultimately you're getting it from someone else and they're getting it from someone else and they're getting it from someone else and so on and so on. So when you start from seed, every seed is a unique phenotype. And what that means is a unique combination of genetics or attributes that, um, you know, this arranges from the smells to the aromas to how tall the plant is to how it branches to what leaf shape it is to what color green it is or purple. You know, all the different attributes that you can find in the cannabis plant. When you start a seed, it's a blend of those attributes from the, the mother and the father uh, that created that cross. And then, you know, you get a small percentage in there that has attributes from maybe the grandparents or even farther back. And so the fun and value of starting from seed is that you don't know what you're going to get, but whatever comes out of there, you get to select it. And once you do that and then propagate it using clones, you now have your own unique, awesome variety that only you have. And that basically, you know, lets you differentiate yourself from all the other growers on the market, which, you know, is really valuable. Um, the other great thing is, is it lets you get access to the latest and greatest genetics out there because when you're buying cuttings, that's something that's already been grown out and evaluated by other people. When you're starting from seed, like you can get stuff that's you know fresh on the market that no one has even you know had time to grow out and evaluate on their own, so that you know you can be first out the gate, if you will. So there's a lot of great advantages to starting from seed. Uh, and you know, if you're really into cannabis growing and really into, you know, all the different attributes you can get between different varieties, you should definitely try starting from seed. And so we did this video, kind of give you guys an overview of what it takes to do that. And so hope it helps. And you know, let's uh, go over what you need to do to start it. All right, the first thing you're gonna need to do before starting your seeds is to fill your trays with soil. Pretty much any soil will do. Um, the seeds aren't too choosy. Uh, general rules apply. You want something that's kind of soft and fluffy, has good uh, drainage and aeration. Basically, it's not going to hold too much water, which can drown the roots and the, the newly developing seed. And you want it to have good aeration so the little developing radical or first root, you know, can get uh, started easily and push its way through the soil without having to work too hard. Um, basically any soil will work. As a general rule of thumb, you want it to have a small particle size as far as the individual components that make up the actual blend. Uh, the reason being is that with some cheaper potting soils, uh, they'll use like chips of wood, but also in some standard potting soils, you'll have uh, like pieces of bark or pieces of undecomposed wood that can be pretty sizable relative to the seed and if in your tray that piece of wood is overlaying like the the seed then that's like having a boulder on top of it and when it tries to grow up it has to push through that um, piece of bark or wood or whatever 
and that can be uh, an impediment to the seed getting started and so you can end up having uneven seed uh, germination as a result of that. Um, similarly, that first little root that's going down there, if it hits some big flat surface like a piece of wood, that's going to you know, slow down its ability to get started or potentially you know, inhibit its ability to get its roots at all. Um, you can also have a similar type problem with, say, like a large size uh, cocoa. So some, with some grades of cocoa uh, or uh, cocoa core, you can get big pieces of coconut husk, um, which can basically have a similar effect as like a, a large piece of wood. So basically, in general, you want something with a fine particle size. Um, as far as fertilizer goes, the seeds themselves, the first two set of leaves, or cotyledons, uh, provide fertilizer for the developing seed for the first you know, week or so, basically until the mature sets of leaves develop. That's basically their role in life, is to act as a food reserve for that initially developing um, seedling. So the soil itself doesn't need any fertilizer initially when the seed gets started. Um, however, once it starts to get established, it is going to need fertilizer in an increasing level relative to the amount of plant material that's there, basically. So, the soil we're using here, this is a three-way mix of some, some cocoa, uh, some uh, peat moss, and some uh, perlite, basically. And so, there's a fair amount of organic fertilizer mixed into this because this is actually our standard mix that we put our regular plants in. We just happen to have this available and so this is what I'm using to start the seeds in. Uh, because it has a decent amount of organic fertilizer mixed in, like some baclano, some bone meal, um, some uh, soybean meal, um, some kelp meal, got a bunch of different fertilizers mixed in there it's not going to need me to add any additional fertilizer for the first couple of weeks. I'm going to be able to just apply regular plain water, which just kind of makes it easier for me. It reduces the labor. So that's something you can do, but you don't have to do. If you're um, applying your fertilizer uh, purely through your water, either chemical or fertilizer, then you're just going to want to start adding fertilizer once the seedlings start growing and getting established a little and we'll go over that later once we get to that point. But so that's basically it as far as the soil. You just want it to be a fluffy, airy soil uh, with a small particle size and you know not a lot of fertilizer in there but if there's a little bit of organic fertilizer preloaded into it not a big deal. Uh, it's pretty straightforward you know I don't need to show you guys how to fill up your trays but basically uh, what I recommend is you want to do mild compaction, but not heavy compaction just because the initially developing seed, you know, it's, it's a small little, you know, developing embryo, so you don't want to give it really hard soil for it to have to push through. It, it probably can, but you don't want to make it have to work too hard, so you don't want to compact it too much. But it's good to compact it a little because otherwise when you go in and water the first couple times the soil is going to tend to sink down and compact heavily or get stirred up and that's going to cause the seed to get all dislodged and float around and that's not good so generally kind of just give it a little bit of a pat down and then wipe it off so you've got a nice uh, level surface so that when you after you're done watering you'll be able to see the individual cells clearly so you can put a seed in the middle of each one and that way they're all centered well and it's all nice and uniform and uh, orderly. Um, you can do whatever you want as far as the soil. As you can see here, I just use this tub we have and pour a bunch of soil into it because it makes it easy for me to just pile the soil under the trays, pat it down and then wipe it off and then move the tray aside and go on to the next one. Uh, and you just go through for your trays and then you go on to watering. So let's go take a look at that now. All right, so I've got the trays laid out here, so we're going to water them in. I would recommend that you get one of these watering wands that has one of the adjustable uh, end pieces to where you can turn it and click it to different types of sprays that come out the end, you know, different spray patterns. The advantage of this is that 
Uh, it has a shower setting, which basically will spread the water out similar to what a shower head does, okay? And the uh, reason why I like that for this is that it's a low volume of water that's spread out. And so by not pressing down on the end all the way, I can apply it gently and uh, do multiple passes, but get minimal compaction of the soil, which is what I want for um, this soil with the seeds. Um, if I use the regular watering wand um, that I use for watering the plants, that's a really uh, high volume. It's a low flow rate, but it's a high volume of water. And so it's hard to apply to the soil without compacting it. So again, I recommend getting one of these spray nozzles with the adjustable um, spray settings. And I'm just going to use the set shower setting here. And I'm not going to press that all the way. I'm just going to gently back and forth. I'm just going to kind of show you what it looks like and then understand that I'm going to do multiple passes to get all of the soil watered in. Uh, and then we're going to put the seed in as opposed to putting the seed in and then watering the plants in. And the reason we're doing that is because there is going to be some degree of soil compaction right now and the soil is potentially going to get stirred up a little bit. And so if we put the seed in there first, then there's a the chance that the seed is going to end up either lower or higher in the soil than what I desire or it might end up moving around so they're not all centered in the individual cells like I originally put them in. So we water first and then put the seed. So let's take a look at how that is. And I'm just going to kind of move my hand up and down a little bit so that the water is not just spraying straight down. It's kind of uh, going back and forth, being a little more gentle in how it hits the soil to further reduce the compaction. And then you just work your way up and down the trays from one end to the other. Move to the next tray. I like to put all the trays just on the ground without having the, the bottom parts in uh, underneath them. Because that way, for this initial watering, I can just apply however much water I need uh, to fully saturate the soil. And if some drains out the bottom, it's not a problem. I'm not going to have to go through and drain a bunch of uh, trays afterward. I just have to pick these up and put them into the bottom half of the trays and it'll be good to go from the seat. And that's basically it as far as the recommendations for water. Uh, uh, so next, uh, we'll take these into the grow room and we'll put some seeds in place so we don't want them. All right, so it's time to start the seeds. I've got some of our Tahoe Jesus back cross seeds here. So basically the first step is to poke some holes in the soil where we're gonna put the seeds. As a general rule of thumb, you wanna put the seeds about two to three times their width beneath the soil surface. So basically take out a seed and hold it up and uh, you want to use a poking tool so I'm using a nail here that I've ground the tip down on but you can use a pencil or a stick or a piece of bamboo or pretty much anything that's you know about the width of the seed or a little bit wider is ideal and the idea is that you figure out the the depth you want to put the seed so two to three times the width of the seed and then you're gonna go through and poke a hole at the exact same depth, depth and at the same size in each single cell. And by using a poking device like this, you ensure that each seed is going to be going to an even depth. And that will basically enable the most uniform germination possible. Whereas if there are different rates, you know, you're going to end up with some breaking the surface at different times and that's going to create lack of uniformity, which is never desirable when you're doing production. So go through and poke all your holes first with whatever your poking tool is. Then uh, take your seeds. We're doing 25 per variety or per cross in this particular batch of seeds. So these are 50 cell trays. So there's 50 cells per tray. 
and it's pretty straightforward once you've got the holes put in there you're just gonna go through and uh, pour the seeds in your hand and just drop the seeds into the holes and I like to go from front to back from one end of the tray to the other just to make it easy to not forget where in the tray I'm putting the seeds it's good to just follow a consistent pattern you can see the seeds for the most part are just kind of falling down in the holes pretty easily there's one or two that are sticking to the sides there and we'll go back and uh, knock those in in a sec There and so that's 25 uh, seeds put in the holes. Got two extra there. So uh, I'm gonna do my poker. So there was a couple here that just kind of stuck to the side. So I'm just gonna push those to the bottom of the hole real quick. But other than that, these all look good. They're all down to the bottom of the holes. So once you've done that, I then like to go and close up the holes. Basically, just do a quick pinch on the top and that's closing the soil above the seed so that you know basically you're trapping in the moisture and uh, blocking out the light and air against the seed and go through and do that and that's basically what you need to do to put the seeds in uh, to plant them and you want to stick your labels in and so there's 25 seeds planted so now the next step is to go through and do a light watering, not a heavy one, just a really light one. And basically what that's gonna do is settle the soil that we just pinched and uh, cause the soil to settle against the seed and ensure good seed uh, to soil contact. And that's important because during the first couple of days, in addition to the water that's gonna coat the seed with this initial watering, you want the soil to touch the seed so that there's a constant source of water that's flowing from the soil to the seed uh, so that it can be hydrated and develop that first root because if you throw the seed in there and then just cover it up but uh, let's say the seed is just kind of like sitting there but there's a bunch of air around it because it's kind of like at the bottom of a cave with like a lid if you will then there's not going to be a lot of water that's soaking into the seed because there's very little seed to soil contact so that's the, uh, the reason why it's good to go through after you've done that initial pinch right after planting the seeds and just do a first watering. So after that, you're pretty much gonna just leave them alone for the first couple of days. Um, we're doing these obviously indoors under these T5 lights. Um, in general, you wanna keep the temperatures about 75 to 80 degrees is ideal. Uh, a little below or a little above that is fine. Their seeds are pretty tough. They're going to sprout and develop, um, you know, in a good range of temperatures, but 75 to 80 is a good range to aim for. We're not gonna use heat mats because the lights are gonna provide plenty of heat to keep the soil warm. And then when the lights are off, it will cool down a little bit, but that's fine because that basically kind of mimics the natural cool down that the seeds would go through um, during the night period outdoors. Uh, but if you're going to be doing these in a situation where they're potentially going to get really cold, if you're in a climate where, you know, during your night temps, it's going to drop down pretty low, then you should use some sort of heat mats or something like that. But we don't need to in our location. So uh, that's basically it. And then, um, we're not gonna put any type of domes on these or any type of covering. I prefer to not do that because when you do that, it traps the air in and uh, limits airflow. And so you end up with a humid, low airflow environment and that really promotes mold and uh, fungus growth on the surface of the soil and that attracts fungus gnats. And fungus gnats are really your uh, biggest threat um, when you're dealing with seeds. Um, next to overwatering and drowning the seeds, the second biggest problem you're gonna have is fungus gnats, uh, in particular their larvae, which are the little kind of clear whitish worms that you'll see in the soil. Um, their larvae will eat the 
the embryo while it's trying to develop and the, they'll eat the root, they'll eat seeds, they'll eat the whole thing. So if you find your seeds don't germinate and you pull it out and you open it up and there's a little worm crawling around in there, it's probably a fungus snack. Um, so by not covering these up and just by leaving these exposed to the light and the air, that limits the amount of mold and fungus growth and that makes it harder for the fungus gnats to be attracted in and get established because they don't have their food source available. Plus the fungus gnats don't like to be in the open air exposed to the light the same way most insects don't. Uh, so uh, yeah, just try to keep the soil pretty evenly moist for you know the first week or two. You should start to see seeds popping within a couple days. We're gonna follow up and take a look at these once we start to see that happening. Um, but until then, just keep the soil moist. If it starts to dry down visibly, just come in and hand water it again using the same shower setting that you know we showed before, or if you're using just whatever type of watering wand, just be gentle to try to not stir up the soil so the seed gets relocated or uh, compact the soil too much um, because that's gonna make it harder for the seed to pop. And that's basically it for the initial planting and watering in of the seeds. So we'll follow up on these guys once they start popping the soil. Okay, so it's been about two days since I planted these and I'm gonna need to water. And I thought I'd take a look at these and show you guys what I'm seeing. And basically there's kind of an uneven dryness in the soil. You can see these dark cells are a little bit more hydrated and then these lighter brown cells have a little bit less water and so you're gonna tend to see this in a tray and that's just gonna happen you know you get um, uneven water application and then you get you know the light hits certain parts of the tray more than others and uh, airflow and just different variables that cause the tray to dry out a little unevenly and you can see this is another tray Kind of the same story, you see how some of the cells are a darker brown and some of the cells have a lighter brown color, um, especially around the edges. And so these lighter brown cells, that's what we're looking for to know that we need to water. And basically, they're a lighter shade uh, in color and the soil starts to suck away from the edge of the cell. and. That's basically because the, the soil media is actually contracting similar to a sponge when it dries out. And so the surface of the soil is dry, but there's still some moisture down below. So the, the cell is not completely dried out. There is still moisture in the media there, but now is the appropriate time to water. Um, by comparison, like if I go over to this tray over here, this tray doesn't need water for the most part. And you can see that the majority of it is still dark. And that tray back there, I've only got half full of seeds, so half of it didn't get watered. And you can see how much lighter the, the part or the half of the tray that didn't get watered is. And so when you're dealing with this kind of uneven watering situation where the, the trays have different amounts of moisture content and obviously some need water, Basically what you want to do is come in and do uh, your first pass on these lighter cells, the ones that need water, and just do one pass on those. Then go through and do your second pass on everything that potentially needs water. If there's a tray you know, that really obviously doesn't, like say these right here, then I'm not going to water those at all. But you know, I'll start with one pass on the dry ones, then do a second pass on, it, on the majority of them, and that will ensure a more uniform um, watering of the, the media and basically you want to kind of take that approach early on because that will help enable the most uniform germination possible because ultimately if you just go through and water all of these the same way then you're going to end up with some that are overwatered, you know inevitably and those are potentially going to drown and uh, affect the uniformity of your germination rate. So just some tips on uh, watering. This is the first time I'm gonna water two days after planting them. So uh, we'll follow up in a little bit once they start sprouting. Okay, so we're at four days after planting our seeds and the seedlings have, for the most part, started sprouting. We've got 
probably about 60 to 70 percent of them have sprouted at this point. Yesterday there was only about four or five that had sprouted and so you know you can see that there's been significant progress at this stage of the game. They start popping pretty much throughout the day so if you check them in the morning and check them again in the evening you'll pretty much see uh, progress in action. Um, it's pretty impressive how fast they grow. So here we've got you know a couple trays of our crosses. Pretty uniform germination. I don't expect them all to sprout on the same day but they're doing a pretty good job of that at this point. You know in general you're going to get a couple you know or a percentage that sprout over you know a couple days before and after all the rest of them so don't panic at a couple of cells not sprouting by and large these are doing good four days after planting I only had to water them the one time at two days after planting them and then this morning I watered a couple of cells that needed it, just a couple though. This tray I thought was interesting because here you've got 24 out of the 25 that are, you know, fully emerged and this one I can see the little uh, stem or hypocotyl popping through the soil but then over here in the same tray this half which is a different cross there's very little happening we've only got you know one two three four and there's one in the back there so two different crosses in the same tray under the same conditions and the difference between 25 having sprouted versus uh, like five and so this doesn't mean that these are all bad you know I mean they might all be dead we'll see um, but more likely they're just slower out the gate than the rest of them or they might have been a little bit weaker the parent plant they came off of might have been not as healthy or not as um, nutritionally uh, full or at a good nutritional status because if the parent plant is hungry then that can lead to uh, hunger seedlings basically. So by and large though I'm impressed with the results. Or not impressed, this is what we expect, you know. But you always want to follow through and check the germination and take notes on anything that does well or doesn't do well and then over here this uh, row is just basically a bunch of different um, stuff from other companies that we've picked up along the way, different trade shows and from associates and whatnot. Doing pretty good. A couple in the back there. Not doing so great. But there's about 500 or so seed we started here so this kind of gives you an idea of what to expect three or four days into the process. Like I say, these are four days after planting the seeds. We've only had to water them once after the initial planting, so that's four days and we'll follow up later to show you the progress as it goes on. Okay, so I wanted to go over with you all what to do when you have the seedlings that pop out of the soil with the seed still wrapped around the leaves or kind of encasing the cotyledons, if you will. And you can see that here. This is going to happen to a small percentage of your seeds, uh, just kind of randomly. It's just one of the things you got to deal with. So I'm going to show you basically what I do. This happens as a result of the position of the seed in the soil basically whether it's positioned upside down or not, which you shouldn't take the time to try and uh, position all your seeds, so that's why we didn't do that. And basically what it is, if the, the root is pointing 
upward naturally when it comes out of the seed initially then the root curls back down and pushes the seed up and as the seed gets pushed upward through the soil the the shell actually gets pulled away from the seedling uh, by the soil basically whereas if the root is pointed straight downward when it first comes out of the seed like it was here then the shell basically stays like like a hat or a cap over the top of the shell as, or over the top of the leaves as the seedling is pushing its way up through the soil so the seed basically the seed shell basically stays trapped on the the seedling if you will and the, you know and so it pops out like this now for the most part eventually the shell will pop out on its own um, or will pop off on its own basically the leaves will expand and elongate enough to break free and push the shell off but uh, what it will tend to do is cause the stem to stretch because as of right now the leaves still think they're under the soil basically because they're not getting any light and so it's telling the the root to stretch 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 and telling the stems to stretch try to push it up you know to get to the light so we want to get this shell off um, and so basically I'm gonna use my hands and a pair of tweezers here you can use just your hands a lot of times but I'm gonna use the tweezers just to show you how I do that basically you're gonna grab onto one side of the shell so I'm, I'm gripping just the the this let's see this side here basically and so I'm gonna pinch that with my fingers and then with the tweezers I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna pry off the the other half and that way I'm not actually really like affecting the ceiling itself I'm just pulling the seed because I the shell because I've got the seed shell pinched my fingers and with the tweezers here and by pulling them apart I can pry the two apart and so if you see there now we've got the shell pulled away from the the leaf so this half's there and now I can just grab that and just kind of pull that off and so we've still got this other half so now I'm going to grab onto the the leaf and the stem itself and just kind of grab this other shell and just pry that off there as you see it comes off pretty easily but like I say you want to grab onto the the ceiling itself and don't just pull because otherwise you'll potentially break the hypocaudal or the first stem there and so you want to grab onto the stem uh, the stem and the leaves while you're pulling off on the shell to get the shell off without breaking the stem and there you go and that you know frees up the leaves and so now these leaves will start to get light and they'll start to open up and expand normally and before long it'll look pretty much like that and that's what they normally look like when they come out of the soil without their shells stuck on them which is you know generally the majority of the time you know and so yeah and that's how you pull that off uh, so when you get the percentage of the shells stuck on the seedlings just use your fingers or a pair of tweezers or a combination of the two and just pry the shells off and that will let your seedlings open up and develop normally all right so we're at one week after planting our seeds and you can see the progress that we've made we had about a 95 percent uh, germination rate for the most part they all did really well there was just one cross that didn't perform as great as the others and we'll take a note of that and not release that to you guys but on the whole these are doing pretty good I'm liking what I'm seeing at this stage I would say the majority of them have sprouted that are going to sprout there are some that sprouted in the past 24 hours but for the most part you know anything that's gonna do its thing has so at this stage I would start feeding them with about a quarter strength of 
whatever you normally feed your plants in uh, your veg stage and then uh, I would do that for about a week and then bump it up to a half strength and then another week bump it up to three quarter strength and then another week bump it up to full strength since we've got the organic fertilizers pre-mixed into the soil I'm just having to give them the clear water without um, any fertilizer added and the, the tell that you can look for to know if your seedlings um, need any water or not any water but uh, fertilizer or not or not if they need it but basically to tell if they're you know at a good nutritional status or not is the cotyledons um, the cotyledons are basically there to act as storage uh, reserves for the developing seedling and so when the seedling gets hungry they're going to be the first to yellow out and so basically the cotyledons if you see um, are nice and green on these and they haven't yellowed out at all um, and so that tells me that the the seedlings are you know getting plenty of nutrients at this stage and if you, you see those cotyledons start to turn yellow, then that's your indicator that your seedlings are getting hungry and you want to uh, bump up your feeding regime. And so yeah, that's it. We're at uh, seven weeks after, or seven days after planting the seeds and I think the next step we'll follow up on is when these have grown a little bit and we're ready to transplant them. So we'll check them out then. Okay, let's do a quick review of what the different parts of the seedling are called. Basically, the leaves that we're most familiar with, the ones that have the jagged serration, these are generally referred to as the true leaves, and these are your actual mature leaves that are going to be what the majority of the leaves grow into once the seedling grows into a mature plant. These round leaves that uh, are the very first leaves that come with the seedling are called the cotyledons and these are basically uh, food reserves they are there to provide the various nutrients and carbohydrates and things that are necessary for the seedling to get started in life before it's had a chance to get its root established in the soil so these are the cotyledons and then the stem of the seedling is called the hypocotyl the stem that occurs above the cotyledons, that's referred to as the epicotyl. So hypocotyl, epicotyl. And then the root of the seedling is referred to as the radical. And so basically the, the seedling has distinctive parts that you know are different from a mature plant and so they have their own specific name so it's good to be familiar with those. And again, it's just the true leaves, the cotyledon, the hypocotyl, the epicotyl and the radical and those are the parts of the seedling all right so we're at four weeks after transplanting our seedlings and it is time to transplant them you can see that they're coming along well basically as far as what you're looking for in uh, what time to transplant them is you want them to stay as long as they can in the containers that they start in to give the roots time to develop so that you can pull these out with a minimal chance of the stems ripping out of the soil. You know, you basically want the roots to pull the soil along with it. And you want to be looking for the foliage to have filled out the cells or the container that you put them in. Um, if you let them get too much more uh, grown than this or too much larger, then you're gonna start to have stretch occur and so that's kind of what you're trying to avoid as far as waiting too long to transplant. So we're at four weeks and you can kind of see the size of them, but you can transplant them, uh, you know, a little bit smaller than this or a little bit bigger than this and it's not gonna be the end of the world. Basically you're just waiting for the roots to get fully developed and, you know, wait for them to fill out the uh, space that they've been allotted to grow in at this uh, tray size. So now we're going to transplant them and I wanted to kind of show you guys how I do that. Generally pull the tray off and instead of 
pulling the seeds out straight, you know, like vertically. Uh, I don't do that because that pulls on the weight of the soil, uh, or the soil pulls down on the stem, and that increases the chance of them basically being separated. So I'm gonna use a pin. Uh, if you use any kind of poking device, your goal is to be kind of as wide as you can get to fit into the hole on the underside of your container. And I'm gonna do two things simultaneously. I'm gonna pull on the stem and shove up on the soil from the underside to um, extract the ceiling from the cell. And I also am going to turn the tray sideways and this helps avoid the weight of the soil being pulling directly down on the stem. So basically I'm gonna take the, the pin, I'm gonna push against the back while pulling out with the stem and I'm gonna eject it like that. And you can see that the roots have developed well um, and basically you're going to, you know, then put it onto the soil and go through and just pop them out one at a time and lay them out. They're gonna be a little bit different uh, heights just because of phenotypic variability. So no big deal, we'll worry about grading them for height later. For the time being, we're just gonna put them all into the uh, tray here and get them all transplanted. And then once we know uh, what their heights are and they're all in their individual containers, then we'll worry about grading them then. And so basically, you just go through and pull them all out, uh, fill out your tray, and then you're gonna take them one by one. Uh, we use a rooting uh, cell that's about the width of two fingers. So whatever size, you know, uh, container you use to plant seedlings in, um, just make that size hole basically. So I'm just gonna stick my fingers down and make a hole that's about the same size as this. So I can just kind of shove it down in there. And then I'm just gonna kind of level the soil off. So, uh, or push it against the transplanted soil. So it's a good fit and just go through real quickly and transplant those all like that. And that's basically what's involved in transplanting the seedlings. Just pull them out, stick them on the soil, and then go through, make a hole, pop them in, and they're transplanted. And then um, once these are all transplanted, I'll go through and water these in so that there's good, um, the good contact as far as the soil is filled in. There's not like an air gap around the rooting plug that I just transplanted. And that's basically what's involved in transplanting. So um, the next stage we'll follow up on will be sexing them. All right, so it's been about a week and a half after transplanting. So we're at about six weeks after planting the seedlings. And see they're coming along and so I just wanted to go over with you basically how the seedlings mature because you can tell from the the leaf count basically or the, the count of the leaflets how the seedling is maturing so down here at the bottom um, you can see we've got the the cotyledon and so that's the little dead round leaf at the base there and sometimes it'll survive for a while, sometimes it'll die like you see here. And so that's the very first set of leaves that was at the seedling. So you know it's a seedling if you can find the cotyledon down there at the very base. Then from that, it goes to the one leaf. So here you can see that the very first leaf after the cotyledons is a single leaf. And so that's the first. And then after that, it goes to three leaves. So one leaf to three leaf. And then from there, it goes up to five leaves. You can see one, two, three, four, five. So one to three to five. And then generally for the mature leaf, you have seven. So you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's basically how the seedling matures. It goes from cotyledon to one to three to five to seven leaflets and then depending on your variety it might go up to nine leaflets um, you know it all just depends or even higher if it's a really sativa sometimes but basically um, you'll see the seedling go through the different leaflet counts as it matures 
and once you get up to this seven leaf that's generally when you're getting into what is actually mature growth as opposed to everything below that which is still semi-juvenile and that's relevant because as a general rule i recommend not uh, topping or cutting back the plant below the mature growth um, where you get the seven leaves or higher because in my experience if you top them before that any nodes that have these semi-juvenile leaves on them are likely to put out semi-juvenile growth as opposed to mature growth and if you keep on hacking back on your plants for whatever reason to you know keep them short or to keep them within the size restrictions they're in or for whatever other reason basically you can keep your plant locked in like a juvenile state and you can really delay it in getting to its mature growth so that's why I recommend not topping or cutting them back below the mature point. So that's it. That's how the leaflets develop as the cannabis seedling matures. Okay, we are now at eight weeks after planting our cannabis seeds. And as you can see, they're coming along nicely. We have them spaced out in trays. They're still in their four inch pots. I would love to have them transplanted into gallons at this point, but we need to maximize the space allocation. So this table is all seedlings. And then over on this side of the room, this table is all seedlings. And then underneath that table is also all seedlings. So that's all the seedlings that we had now all space so as you see it rapidly increases in the amount of square footage it's required to grow these out so it is time to sex our seedlings at this point because now at this point they are starting to show the signs of what sex they're going to be so here i have two seedlings pulled out these are uh, our lime og crossed with our g13 alpha dog purple and one of these is a female and one of these is a male. I've already sexed these. And you can tell because on the label, I've put a blue mark on the top of the female and I've put a red mark on top of the male. And so I just do that as a quick indicator of, you know, whether they're male or female. But the reason why I wanted to show you these from this distance is so that you see that there's no obvious signs, you know, from working distance of whether they're male or female. You really have to get in close in order to see which sex they are. And so to do to show you that, I'm gonna have to switch out to my macro lens, which I'm gonna do in a second here. But basically where you're gonna be looking for the signs of the sex are in the the nodes, which is the part of the branching architecture where the leaf stem meets the primary stem and where the new branches start growing out of. That's called the node, and that's uh, basically a part of the plant's natural architecture. And so that's where you're gonna find your sign of what sex the plant is, is right there at that node at the intersection of the leaf and stem. So that's where we're gonna be taking a closer look when I switch out to my macro lens here. So let's do that now. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the female first since that's what you're most likely gonna be familiar with and have the easiest time identifying. You're looking at the crook between the leaf stem, the primary stem, and the little developing branch there. This is the node area right here. And you're not looking for the leaf spur, which is that little undeveloped pointy leaf right there. You're looking for the little growth behind it, and that's right there. And that, if you look real close, you can see is kind of like a narrow onion shaped. And that's the female uh, anatomical part of the cannabis species, and that's a bract or a calyx. And since it's just getting started, there's no hairs coming out of it, so it's you know, you have to look close to be able to identify it, but if you really look at that shape, you'll be able to see it at this stage before the hair is developed. But we're gonna take a look next at what it looks like as it develops a little farther along so you can see what the mature female flower looks like 
but again if you develop the eye for it and you know get uh, get to know that little narrow onion shape you'll be able to identify what your females are when they're at this stage of development so now we're looking at a more mature female you can see that the bract or calyx there now has a pair of hairs extending out of the tip those are also called the pistils and that's your first sure sign that this is a female cannabis seedling you can identify it before it has those by the distinctive narrow onion or teardrop shape of the bract or calyx there but once you see those two hairs coming out, then you know for sure that you have a female. All right, so here we're looking at the male. The part you're looking for again is at the crook between the main stem, the leaf stem, the branch is coming out and behind the leaf spur. And it's in the node here. And you can see at the base there is that kind of round ball shape. And that's the male. And what distinguishes it is it's one overall kind of fat round shape as opposed to being long and narrow and pointy like the female. But then also if you look really close, you can see that the ball itself is actually made up of a number of small leaves that start at the base and come up and wrap to the top. And those are not actually leaves, they're called sepals, but they resemble leaves and they're kind of like petals on a flower in that they unfold and they're actually wrapped around what are called the stamen and that's what produces the pollen. And so those sepals are going to unfold to expose the stamen which release the pollen. And so early on in the development, the male is basically a ball like that. It's kind of pointy at the top, but it's distinctly fat and round and made up of a number of small leaves. And so that's what you're looking for to identify the male in your cannabis seedlings. And so next we'll take a look at what to seed uh, for how it develops so you can see what a more mature male looks like. Okay, so here you can see a male flower that is a little farther along in development. This shows you that as the male part of the anatomy develops, it basically creates a series of balls that are stacked on top of each other as opposed to developing a hair like we saw happen in the female flower as it matures. So if you're uncertain about whether or not the round ball shape you're looking at is a male or not, you can always wait a little bit longer and before long you'll start seeing more balls appear if it is a male. Or alternatively, it's, if it's a female, you'll see hairs come out. All right, so that concludes our complete guide to starting cannabis seeds. I hope that was helpful and we thank you guys for watching and for giving our genetics a try. We wish you all the best of luck in all of your cannabis growing endeavors.